Hi everybody, Dacob here. Welcome back to Totally Dacob. Today we'll be reviewing Alien Romulus. I've just been to the pre-world launch, which is just a day before the world launch, so technically it's kind of already open to the public, so 15th of August uh, at none less than the Chinese Theater in LA. So what a wonderful experience to be in Hollywood and to be in such a historic venue for a franchise, quite frankly, that uh, I personally love very much ever since the first Alien with Sigourney Weaver, then Aliens, and uh, even Alien 3 and Alien Resurrection. You know, Prometheo is not, not a big fan. I'm a huge fan of H.R. Giger's artwork. Anyway, what I'm showing you right now as I review the movie it are scenes that I shot walking, uh, you know, uh, surrounding the Chinese theater area, all of the alien Romulus posters, as well as the interior of the Chinese theater, um, the decoration and all the advertisements that they're using for alien Romulus. I find it very fascinating and interesting. So it is a little bit of a different type of review. Instead of showing you screenshots and snippets of the movie, it's going to be kind of a, a flux of ideas and thoughts. So subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, uh, thumb up this video, and uh, let's get to it. So spoiler alert, this will be a spoiler-filled review. Now, you know, it's a little bit discombobulated. Where to begin with? Um, I, like I said, love Alien. I love the xenomorphs, I love the face huggers, the chest bursters, the whole metamorphosis, the transformations that these creatures go through in their lifespan and the entire body horror that uh, is combined with it, as well as the entire H.R. Giger subliminal and not so subliminal in many cases, especially in Giger's own artwork, um, sexual aggression that goes with uh, his particular art. And artwork. Obviously, they could not translate that, that type of artistry into the movies, but they come pretty close with the very clear shapes of these creatures and how they penetrate the human body to lay the egg, to, to mix the DNA, and then the chest bursting. The, the head shape of the alien is also very clear. Now, in Alien Romulus, there's a, a few issues that, that I have with this movie. So, um, First of all, the history of the creation of Rome, uh, Romulus and Remus, the, the two brothers that were fed by uh, the um, the wolf. Uh, Romulus, in the myth, kills Remus. They, they are the founders of Rome, mythologically speaking. So I was expecting this station, space station, that these very young actors and actresses uh, were going to go to would be split between Romulus and Remus. And I thought maybe Remus is going to be the alien infested side of the station, um, while Romulus is going to be the clean one, kind of like the separation of uh, society. You know, you have the poor on one side and the rich on the other, the untouchables on one side and then the holy on the other. But no. So first, first thing I noticed as the movie goes along, and I repeat spoilers uh, uh, ahead, you know, it's the, uh, the fact that both Romulus and Remus are infested. So I personally did not see a big reason to split up the station in two sides. Now, uh, the movie begins with, Basically, Wutani, the corporation, uh, Wayland Wutani, finding, like, flying or whatever, going through space towards the Nostromo that is now in pieces and parts. It's it's gone. It's exploded. Um, although, well, anyway, I mean, Sigourney Weaver, you know, Ripley kind of survived, and she's the only survivor of the Nostromo. So why is the Nostromo now completely frozen in space and bits and pieces exploded. Anyway, she made the alien fly out of the Nostromo and she is, well, we thought the alien, the 1979 alien was dead in space, frozen. Well, it turns out that the alien managed to survive 
and uh, cocooned itself in sort of a protective shield of sorts. And uh, the Bhutani uh, company found that cocoon and took it on board of a spaceship, which then transported it to what I believe is the Romulus slash Remus space station for further analysis, DNA testing, probably trying to figure out how to utilize this creature the best they can in order to create either weapons or a perfect worker for themselves so that they don't have to any longer enslave the people to work for them. I mean, illegal slavery, as we see in the movie as the youngest character. Um, I just finished watching the movie, by the way. I don't remember any one of their names, but the lady, the main female character, our modern day Ripley, basically, you know, she kind of collected enough points to fly off that Wutani planet uh, that is not planet Earth. It's a kind of a colony um, with miners just working, you know, their butts off for that company, but never really earning enough money to, to be free. So they sold their soul to the company store, basically. And we see that very clearly towards the beginning of the movie when she goes into one of these offices, the Wutani offices, and says, hey, I've uh, earned enough points uh, to leave this planet. And then uh, the lady that works in that office, you know, which is supposed to resemble, I guess, our government and every bureaucratic motion that you try to do, <laughs> You know, in modern day society, uh, the lady working in the office does not want to help her whatsoever, but instead sees on the computer screen that this young lady did collect enough points and she could leave the planet and she could be, uh, you know, sent off to a better place like she requests. But however, her request is denied and the lady instead of just letting her go says no now you have to like earn double the amount of points and you're going to have to work another i don't know six or 12 years i forgot the number so basically she's a slave to the company and so we realize how injustice thrives in the future and the Wutani company we already know since the first alien in 1979 that it is a very very sneaky and manipulative company that would do anything and walk over dead bodies to obtain its goal, which is power, money, and um, corruption all around. So she has uh, a cyborg, uh, or I don't even know at this point how do they, what are they called? The artificial intelligence. You know, our good old cyborgs like Ian Holm was our first one in in the first Alien. By the way, he's coming back in this Alien as well. The deep fake facial reconstruction they did, whether it be CGI or partially puppeteering, at times it works, at times it doesn't, but we'll get to that later. So she has a brother. Now, he's not the main female character has a brother. He's not her real brother. I mean, he is a cyborg uh, or a robot or whatever you want to call them. And uh, he um, she's white. He's black. And he's very dear to her heart because uh, he was programmed or made or saved by her father. Her father is no longer with her. So she treats him as a brother, basically. So for the first time, well, not really for the first time. We already had Winona Ryder being um, kind of a good robot, a good cyborg, not just evil like the first one was from Alien 1. So it's not that it's not it's not like it's the first time we see a cyborg being positive in the alien saga, but whatever. He is seemingly very nice, actually borderline autistic. He has issues. He trusts everybody and everything. His uh, little sister or big sister always has to tell him, don't trust anyone. Don't be so naive. There's a lot of scammers out there. So we get to know this character as uh, somebody who is naive and in many ways, um, I don't know, just uh, trusting of everybody, which is kind of the opposite of what a robot is programmed to do usually. But anyway, we digress. So she has a group of friends. They're all very young and they're all working on this um, colony planet. Uh, they're all working 
in the mining field, everything is dirty. There's a lot of clouds in the atmosphere. You never really get to see the sun. She dreams of being at a sunset or a sunrise. and uh, But her reality is kind of that dirty, soiled reality where you spend your entire life in the mines. Interesting connection to the history of mining also on planet Earth is the canary the or whatever bird they had in cages. There's one scene where a, a more elderly miner, and this makes the main character think she's also going to spend her entire life mining. He's walking by with a cage and a little bird in the cage. And usually, you know, the canaries, when they kind of faint, uh, they sense gas leakages, and um, if a canary sings or faints, that means uh, you have to leave and escape from the mines because an explosion might happen. So that's a very old technique used on planet Earth, which apparently they've transplanted also into the future on some colonial planet. So nobody has the money, apparently, to go into this cryogenic state, uh, freezing themselves to be able to fly light years, many light years away to better planets, and they never managed to earn enough money to be able to afford such transportation and leave the um, mining planet slash colony. So her friends also want to leave. Uh, one of these young friends is very good with technology and noticed that there is a signal in space very similar to what Nostromo sees oh, the spaceship kind of receives a signal from a planet that it's not really on their course in Alien 1, and that signal leads them to the planet where the aliens are. So kind of similar in this movie, and we're going to see a lot of references to other alien movies and parts of, of the saga, including Prometheus, um, and so one of these elements that is kind of like a callback, if you may, or an Easter egg to Alien 1 is the fact that uh, one of the characters gets a signal from space that a huge spaceship is in the proximity of the planet, is actually in the orbit of the planet, and uh, it's going to crash into the ice ring of the planet. So... They wish to go to the station, which seems to be abandoned. Well, first they think it's a spaceship, right? And they want to go there to get um, these uh, machines that they need in order to freeze themselves long enough to fly in space and reach a better planet, a better destination, a better life. So they try to convince our main female character and her... Uh, let's call him brother at this point, Andy, even though he's not a brother, right? But she considers him a brother, uh, to, uh, fl uh, to fly up into space, into the orbit of the planet, to kind of enter that spaceship and steal the um, cryogenic or whatever they're called, uh, whatever machinery they need to freeze themselves to, to fly many, many years in space. She doesn't want to in the beginning. Then she asks, why are you doing, why do you need me? And then they said, well, we need your robot because he is from, he's made by Butani. So Wayland Butani made him. He can access their panels on this spaceship. He can open doors. He can probably grant us access to the spaceship without him. We probably won't be able to enter. So they managed to convince her and she leaves with them. Now, as they approach the spaceship, they realize it's not a spaceship, it's a space station. And nobody seems to be alive on this space station. They first land on the Remus side, and then later on they're going to switch to the Romulus. Both sides are infested with aliens, so I'm like, what's the use of even having two split parts? It would have, I mean, symbologically speaking, I understand the reference, loose reference also to Prometheus and uh, the engineers creating life and, and that black goo. The black goo is on the Romulus side. But uh, 
I have questions. I mean, I understand that uh, this movie happens right after Alien and right before Aliens. But now we know what happened before Alien, right? We also know the story of Prometheus. And um, am I a fan of Prometheus? Not so much. Not a big fan of the entire genetic mutation and kind of the humanoid looking creatures that turn into monsters depending on how this DNA is mixed and like telling us, hey, only God, you know, owns the power to create or potentially destroy. Humans should not have that power. And if given the power in form of this black goo, humans can only create more death. And in fact, every time they try to manipulate the DNA of the aliens or even before the aliens were created, as we see step by step happening during Prometheus, they always seem to, humans always seem to make mistakes and create monstrosities. Also something even before Prometheus was shot, also something we very clearly see the Weyland Mutani company wanting to do with Ripley in Alien 3, then Ripley realizes and understands what they really want to do, so she unalives herself as the alien queen bursts from her chest, right? Still in Alien Resurrection, they managed to collect Ripley's DNA with the alien queen's DNA mixed from that heating, heated pool of lava that she fell into in alien, at the end of Alien 3. And uh, we see Alien Resurrection in Alien 4 and a lot of DNA testing and mutations and they try to bring Ripley back to life as a clone. They try to clone the alien and there is a scene in which Sigourney Weaver sees all the monstrosities that this company has done as they were testing and trying to replicate the genomes and the DNA of both Ripley and Alien and uh, all of the mutations and mutants that were created in the process just kind of proved to us how humans should just, well, doesn't prove anything to us. The makers of the movie would like to indicate to us that humans should just let it be. They, 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 humans should not <clears throat> meddle in creation. So again, this concept is taken into Alien Romulus. So in Alien Romulus, we see how the Wutani company is trying to extract the DNA of the alien. Now, I have a question here. How did they manage to capture the frozen, fully grown xenomorph alien from space, floating around the Nostromo, and from the DNA of a male alien, because that was not an alien queen, how did they manage to get the face huggers? Because the uh, the the, Rem the Remus and Romulus station is infested with face huggers, and uh, not just free roaming face huggers on both sides of the station, but also face huggers that are frozen, that are captured, that are kept also in cryogenic state for whatever future scientific research they need to do. So if all of the face huggers were created from the DNA of the fully grown xenomorph male alien that was frozen in space and captured around Nostromo, how? How was that even possible? I don't think that's possible. I don't think that from a male alien you could create face huggers. Uh, unless, of course, they got the face huggers centuries prior already in their collection in their archives, as we've seen from Prometheus and the follow-up movie to Prometheus, that, I th like a Alien Covenant, um, that could be the reason why they have facehuggers to begin with. But then why would they need to get a hold of the frozen alien from Nostromo? You, you see what I mean? Like, it's either or. I mean, either they already had all the face huggers and all the DNA and everything they needed to create more aliens and to test on them, as we've seen per Covenant and uh, um, Prometheus and Alien Covenants, because the Wutani company already had all of that DNA, right? So if they had all of that and they already had the face huggers, why did they need to capture the frozen alien in space from the Nostromo? 
if they needed to capture the frozen alien in space from a storm, which is, I repeat, not a queen, what good would it do them to capture that alien? You know, so a little bit of an explanation, even though I did watch the movie in IMAX and the sound was just extremely loud. So Ian Holmes' character, you cannot really understand if you're watching this movie in IMAX, every word he's saying. So when we do see the carcass of the Nostromo alien, it's kind of, um, he, he looks at it and all of uh, the young cast looks upwards because he looks up and they see that it's kind of hanging from the ceiling with that original skull design that was enshrined inside of the dome of the head of the alien. That is the original alien from 79, unlike all of the follow-up aliens. Um, he did mention one of the reasons why that alien was sacrificed the way it was. And, but again, no explanation as to how did we get from that alien to the facehuggers. So there's that question. Second question, once the facehuggers are freed, some of them are already free on the Romulus side, but once the facehuggers are freed from the cryogenic state on the Remus side, because obviously once the kids enter the space station to try to steal the pods um, to freeze themselves and travel to a better place, they enact a series of events that trigger the station to turn on, uh, the um, atmosphere inside the station warms up, uh, the frozen face huggers kind of warm up and become alive and burst out of their containment chambers and, of course, shit hits the fan and uh, one of the first characters gets infested. Now, another issue here is, I mean, they couldn't kill off the first person to die in a horror movie. <laughs> in the past was usually a black person. Now the only black character is a robot. Aliens have no use for him, so he's going to live. But so the second best choice to eliminate first was an Asian actor. Okay, are we really going to do that in 2024? Yes, we went there and we did that. Um, so the lovely lady gets infested by the face hugger. And Something new to the franchise is, uh, well, the team thinks, how do we get the facehugger off of her in time before it lays the egg and mixes the DNAs? Uh, and uh, they come up with the idea that maybe they can try to freeze the tail of the facehugger so the tail will let go of her neck and not suffocate her. They do that, but it's too late. The facehugger already planted the seed. And so my next question is, how come just 10 minutes after the seed was planted, the chest burster bursts out of her. And I mean, I know that these mutations and evolution, it goes really fast. But, and it goes faster the more we progress in the franchise, like Alien 3 and then Alien 4. But then we know that Ripley had the queen inside of her, which that's why in Alien 3 they explain, well, the chest burster is not going to burst out of Ripley that fast because the queen takes more time to develop. Mm. But we are just a short time span after Alien 1 and the first face hugger from Alien 1 from the time it infected its host to the moment where the chest burster burst. A little bit more time passes, not just 10 minutes. So how come this process is so speeded up? And then not just that, but after the chest burster is out, his metamorphosis begin or its metamorphosis begins very quickly. In fact, uh, the first mutation happens within a couple of seconds, and then it cocoons itself inside of that uh, very Freud visual of a vagina dentata, um, that kind of vaginal cocoon with a, a, a poke, a tooth kind of poking out of it, which is typical in. Um, psychiatry or psychology or psychoanalysis, the, again, the, the deep sexual fears of a human being growing up, like I get all the whole, the whole context, but, um, you know, that went really fast. The alien, I, I would have liked to see after so many iterations of alien, 
the first four movies, you know, Prometheus Covenant, even Alien vs. Predator. Like, it would have been cool to have something new in this movie and that something new could have been cool if it were us seeing how the alien between being tiny and then growing and mutating and passing through the cocooning stage into a fully grown alien, it would have been cool to see the alien build its cocoon. Instead, like literally five minutes after it, it, it burst out of a chest, it, it's it, we already have a fully grown alien inside a cocoon on the spaceship. Like, how did that even happen? Way too fast. Um, and that's an issue I'm having. Of course, Ian Holm's character is, again, evil and trying to get the black goo, which we find on the Romulus side of the spaceship, trying to get that goo back to the Wutani company to make them research more and develop the perfect being that they're so apparently obsessed with. I guess they just want to create a perfect slave that's going to work for them because humans die too quickly. They need more care and attention. They need to be fed. They need medicine. It's just not as profitable as having aliens working for you, I suppose. So they're trying to tame them, use them as weapons, but also use them as workers. Obviously, that does not work because with aliens, as we know, they just survive and live and procreate. That's basically all they're meant to do. We never really see them eat either. They capture humans to attach them to their nests uh, for the queen to lay an egg and the egg to hatch and the face huggers to come out of the eggs and infect the host. In fact, the fully grown aliens, and there are quite a few of them on Romulus, they have uh, started to build that typical nest that we've seen in Aliens, the Cameron version of Alien, the Alien 2. Uh, so one part of Romulus is very organically alien-like built. You know, it's like kind of entering the belly of the beast. So here we are referencing aliens, and uh, we have that blue light on the floor, which I remember an interview with Ripley, uh, Ridley Scott saying that originally for Alien 1, they were planning of creating, uh, as the first host gets infested, uh, infected, um, in Alien 1 on the planet, he's supposed to trigger the eggs to know that he's arriving inside of the nest. And how were how was the original plan, according to Ridley Scott? By the way, everything I say in this video is for entertainment purposes only. Not rooted in truths or facts. Everything's alleged in just my opinion. So Ridley Scott said in an interview, if I remember correctly, that he his idea was to build this mucus type of almost vaginal tissue where the um, character kind of enters the womb and it really, that entire feeling and the wetness and, and the sliminess of it kind of entering into the womb and as that membrane is penetrated, the eggs are triggered to know that a host is nigh. So, but there was no budget for that, so they created this uh, whole other concept of, oh no, or was that Cameron and Aliens? Well, they have that same concept in Aliens as well in Alien 2 with the blue light on the floor. That blue light is part of the alien organism close to the nest. And when a host steps into that blue light, it's almost like you trigger an alarm and the aliens know you're there. So that's why that blue light is there. So again, a reference to the first alien uh, in Alien Romulus. Um, but again, where's the queen? We do not see an alien queen in this movie. At first I thought, interesting, the first person to be infected, the Asian actress, who was, by the way, amazing. She did a great job. Uh... I thought she's going to carry the queen. And maybe the whole battle is going to be with a queen in this movie and maybe one other warrior, alien, male alien, whatever they're, or neutral alien. But, you know, and then when the chest burster came out of the first host, I was like, oh, okay, this is not a queen. But interesting, maybe they're just going to be dealing with one alien 
fully grown, and a bunch of face huggers. Why not? You know, what a great callback to the original alien. Like, they only had one alien on, their, on, on the Nostromo. And I loved that. The, the panic, the fear. That movie is just a masterpiece. But instead, no. They did not limit themselves to just that one alien and a bunch of face huggers that were in cryogenic sleep and then woke up, but they have a whole nest of aliens waiting on the Romulus side without us seeing a queen and without us seeing a nest of eggs. There are no eggs, you know. There's just kind of laboratory-grown face huggers. And, but still, nevertheless, the fully grown aliens built their nest, I guess, while they're waiting for one of the face huggers to deliver a queen. And so we're not battling one alien here. We're battling several, plus a bunch of face huggers. We have a new revelation and realization in this movie, and that is that the face huggers react to heat and loud noises, or any noises really. So the, they try to elevate the heat of the room to match the heat of the human beings, and they walk past, because there's a scene where they have to walk past face huggers to reach the next level. And that's something we haven't seen before. Quite fascinating. The puppeteering of those um, face huggers was a little bit meh. <laughs> but okay, I still prefer that to CGI face huggers. Um, so the characters were walking past them, and it is kind of scary to see that, you know, to feel the tension as they're passing by the face huggers, trying to not be nervous, trying to not raise their body temperature. In, because if they if they were to raise their body temperature, their body temperature would be higher than the room temperature. Hence, the face huggers would immediately detect them. So you can imagine how that goes. It goes terribly wrong. In the beginning, it works, but then something happens and uh, they get detected by the face huggers and the face huggers attack. Now, in the preview and the trailers, the face huggers looked much more aggressive, and they looked vicious. They looked fast. I mean, it was insane, right? That trailer, those several trailers really made me think, oh boy, we are on a whole other level. Instead, minus the few scenes that we've seen in the trailer, which are also in the movie, most of the other scenes with the facehuggers are quite mellow. Um, there's a lot of facehuggers in this movie, more than actually fully grown xenomorphs. <laughs> But uh, and I don't mind that, but they're not as quick or fast or vicious as the trailers kind of led me to believe they would be. And uh, so, so there, there's our reference to aliens with with the whole nest situation. But there was no queen. The Android robot uh, from the past bringing back from the dead Ian Holm is like, okay, he's still evil. He's trying to manipulate the situation. He's also trying to reprogram Andy. And he manages to do so in the beginning of the movie. And in fact, Andy is now all of a sudden the evil guy and he is executing the orders of the original 79 Android. Now, that changes later on because his sister manages to switch his programming chip again, and Andy is good in the end. But here's here's the thing. One of the characters is pregnant. One of the ladies in this movie is pregnant, and she's pregnant. We don't know by who. Somebody from the mining planet that she says he's just an asshole. She's there with her brother. She says, please don't tell my brother that I'm pregnant because like he's going to be upset. The brother does find out that she's pregnant. The, the plot twist here, and here we start referencing the weakest of the Alien movies, which is Alien Resurrection. And once I heard that she was pregnant towards the first ha ending of the first half of the movie, I immediately thought, oh, okay, I see where this is going. Like, I immediately knew if one of the characters is pregnant, we're going to have her give birth to some mixed humanoid alien at the end. It's going to be very alien resurrection, and I hated that. Okay, just to be very clear, um, because that's also something I did not like from Covenant. I don't like these mutations of the aliens. 
going from I like my xenomorphs. You know, the xenomorph alien, the face hugger, the chest burster, like the alien queen from aliens is also awesome. That's it. Like stick to that. You know? But no, they had to bring in the black goo. They managed to extract on that station the black goo before the aliens took over. How the aliens took over the station and killed all the personnel, we do not know. We can only imagine. But here we are. We're we're in a position where the evil android is like saying, here, my mission is to save the black goo. So I'll allow you access into the main laboratory where you're going to get this DNA or this black goo. Take it with you. We have to deliver it to the Yutani company. I'm not going to let you leave the spacecraft unless you don't deliver the goods. If you don't, you're going to die here. So that's kind of how they decide to take the DNA with them. Um, one of the xenomorphs manages to kidnap the pregnant lady and entraps her in the nest as basically they're waiting for a face hugger to attach itself to her and impregnate her, right? Or seed her. And that she, she was basically glued on very aliens. So this is again, referencing alien Two. she's attached to this wall of alien, you know, interiors, interior decorating by the aliens. And she's kind of fainting, but breathing heavily and like uh, moaning a little bit. And that's why one of the characters hears her, runs to her. I'm like, that took a long time. Okay. In all this time, no face hugger came to infect her? Really? Because the face huggers were very, very quick to respond once the guy came to try to rescue her. Interesting, right? So it's kind of like, I don't like when these choices are lazy, when the filmmakers, the showrunners, they kind of, because it's convenient to them, they decide to not make the plot progress in a certain direction. Because logically speaking, the second she's attached to that wall by the xenomorph, a face hugger is right there to infect her immediately. Why did the face hugger wait? Like, half an hour, you know, 20 minutes. Why didn't it infect her? Oh, oh, it didn't because it was convenient for the plot line. And I don't like when I smell laziness and I smell laziness there. But anyway, they free her from that situation. She's losing a lot of blood. The evil android says to them, inject her with the black goo. That's the only way you can save her. Because he wants to see experimentations happening with human beings and the black goo. So they say, no, we're not going to do that to her. We don't trust the black goo. But then guess what? Plot twist. She does it to herself because she gets scared and paranoid. She's all alone in the elevator, kind of going upwards towards the spaceship to escape. And she decides, you know what? Let me inject myself with the black goo. That, of course, turns into alien resurrection because now the baby, and she has a human baby because she was impregnated before she left her planet. Well, not her planet, the mining planet. But the DNA from the black goo mixes with her DNA and turns her baby into an alien baby. But the alien baby is a completely mutated, weird monstrosity similar to the alien and alien resurrection but, of course, they had to now, since we have Prometheus as well in the roster, they had to make this new alien baby look like one of the engineers. So this alien baby that the female character, not main character, side chick, gave birth to, like she births this pod and inside the pod is the alien acid, and out of the acid comes this baby, which also grows within two minutes, fully grown, like ginormously looking mutation that just isn't human, isn't alien, isn't an engineer. It's now a mix between an alien, a xenomorph, an engineer, and a human. Of course, it kills its own mother. It wants to kill everything. It does have a mouth-in-mouth -mouth action feature slightly different the little mouth inside the big mouth has like four little tentacles it looks like a leech more than a mouth with teeth 
Um, and, if, and it just wants to kill. And it really kind of looks like Freddy Krueger. If Freddy Krueger had like a white silver mask. Kind of creepy. A little bit Freddy Krueger and a little bit the mummy. The Brendan Fraser mummy. <laughs> like The mummy and Freddy Krueger. That's the vibe. Really, I did not like it at all. And uh, so basically final battle. Uh, it, they have to get rid of this mutation so the the full the full blown romulus remus space station is heading towards a collision course towards the rings around this planet and the rings are made of ice and it does collide with the ice and it explodes the evil uh, Cyborg wanted the black goo to be taken off the space station before it collided and he thought he managed his task by kind of, you know, manipulating the pregnant girl into injecting herself with the black goo. So she gives birth to this monstrosity uh, on top of a spaceship that left the space station. The space station is now exploding. The final scenes with this mutated alien that is referencing Prometheus and Alien Resurrection. That's the final boss, the boss level, the final boss level of the movie. And of course, they managed to get rid of him or it. And it also kind of explodes and falls and kind of gets torn to a crisp over the ice rings of the of the colony planet. And I wish I would have seen and that's the end. Basically, we have the main female character then putting into cryogenic sleep, Andy, and she also puts herself to sleep. And just like with Ripley, we have her final log from her own spaceship saying, this is my final log. I'm looking, you know, towards looking forward to seeing a sunrise, blah, blah, blah. You know, the whole morale of the story is we have to accept uh, our difference, embrace the differences. And I mean, because the planet that she's heading towards does not accept uh, robots or cyborgs, but she's going to make it work somehow. She doesn't know how, but she doesn't want to abandon Andy. The beginning of the movie, they told her, you have to abandon Andy to go to that other planet where the sun always shines. And then Andy hears that. He's sad, but he says anything to make my sister happy. Then when Andy's reprogrammed in the movie to be evil, he has to leave her behind. And then she learns her lesson. She's like, oh, yeah, I was such a bitch to want to leave him behind. Now he's leaving me behind for the sake of Wutani. I've learned my lesson. Then Andy gets re-reprogrammed again and he's a good guy again. And then she tells him, I'm so sorry, I'll never let you go. I'll never abandon you. That's kind of the morale of the story. I And the movie ends there, you know. We don't know if there's a face hugger still lurking in the background. There is no, at least in IMAX, there was no post-credits scene. None of that. If the movie does well, and I do believe it will do well because, I mean, they are promoting the bejesus out of this movie. There's probably going to be a part two. Who knows? Maybe not. But I miss more of the action with the Xenomorph. I would have really, really preferred to have them just be alone on that huge station with the one Xenomorph and a bunch of face huggers. That's fine. Trying to infect them. But battling that one Xenomorph and that one Xenomorph getting some special powers of sorts, that would have been really cool to see, you know, uh, instead of them kind of trying to put too many ingredients into this recipe, into this pasta, you know, simplicity is key with this. Also, scenes in which the Xenomorphs are not really quick, you know, they used to be. I mean, ruthless killers in the other installments of, of Alien. Not in this movie. Yeah, sure, they're killers and they're dangerous. But there's a scene where she, our main female character and Andy are waiting for the elevator to arrive. And it's literally right in front of the nest of the aliens. There's a bunch of aliens plus face huggers coming their way. And they are slow. Like, she has enough time to talk to Andy, to discuss what to do next. 
make up her mind how she's going to fight them. And this is like, I mean, literally, the aliens are just a jump away from her. But no, <laughs> again, the laziness of the plot here of the filmmakers, they, they thought, well, we need her to have this psychological moment. So let's just make the aliens move slower because we need it for our purposes. I'm like, yeah, but that doesn't make any logic, doesn't make any sense with how the aliens usually behave. Then another new thing we haven't seen before is it, when she kind of shoots through the aliens and all of the acid spills, she kind of turns off the, um, the uh, what's it called? The, um, <laughs> geez, <laughs> it's really hot outside and I'm like completely melted now after uh, the movie. The um, gravitational pull of the spaceship of the space station. So she turns off the gravitation and all of those aliens start floating. Then she shoots them all. So all of their acid blood is now floating. Now, you know, if you know anything of physics, even in a scenario where you have no gravitation, if you shoot with such brutal force, with such a huge weapon like she had, if you shoot through one of those creatures, their blood is still, it's going to fly in all directions. It's going to float because there's no gravitation, but it will, the, the, the sheer force with which they would explode due to the weapon hitting them, that explosion alone would cause their blood to expand and to touch the walls, the very, very, by the way, tight enclosed space where they were, where she shot them, that alone would have made that blood, that acid blood, touch the walls of the um, space station and it would have just burned a hole into them and they would have all been sucked out into space, right? But that didn't happen. And again, because the filmmakers, they wanted a cool scene with floating al green alien blood, but they didn't want it to touch the walls of the space station because if it did that scene would be over in a jiffy and everybody would be dead so they just decided that even if you shoot through an alien that blood is just going to stay where it is it's not going to move anywhere until the gravitational pull is back again and all the blood falls down and does make a hole in the station in that sector of the station just in time for our main characters to exit that level and close the door so they do not get sucked out into space. Beautiful scene to see them kind of walk through the acid green blood. But the logical side of me, and mind you guys, I'm not a very physical, like um, physical, physical, maybe I am physical, but physics is not my forte, okay? So I'm not that asshole that's going to sit there and say but this makes no sense all the time like visually it was beautiful to see that blood floating and them kind of walking through the blood it's something we've never seen in the alien franchise before but they could have found um a more credible way to achieve that effect in other words you know in filmmaking they say like the psychology of it it wasn't really an earned moment okay hate to be a party pooper there so I would have preferred to have seen just one xenomorph in the whole movie and then battling this xenomorph on the space station. And I would have also liked to have seen more of the xenomorphs. I have the feeling always these xenomorphs are put to the side in favor of somebody trying to create some new monster. But these new monsters are terrible. Why do you need to do that? Stick with what's good. H.R. Giger's Aliens are a masterpiece. Stick to them. There's no need to create this weird genetic mutation mix between uh, Prometheus engineers, humanoids, humans, and, and xenomorphs. It just, why? It, you know, it did not really work in, in Alien Resurrection, and it's not really working now either. I would have just liked to have spent more time with an alien xenomorph. Another question that I have is, why, when the main female character is in the elevator, Shaft 
and gravitation pull goes and comes back again. It keeps going and coming, by the way. It doesn't just happen once that gravitation goes and comes back. So when gravitation comes back, she starts falling down the shaft. A xenomorph actually cat catches her before she plummets to her death. Can you believe? And now, again, this defeats completely the logic of the xenomorph because a xenomorph would have... So he catches her with her tail, or it catches her with its tail. Like twirls her around with its tail, right? Now, usually, a xenomorph, as we were kind of taught to, to, to believe and think, is, well, it would have perforated her with its dagger tip of the tail. It would have caught her like a shish kebab. That's how a xenomorph would have caught her, like a shish kebab, okay? Instead, no, it gently <laughs> grabs her around the waist with its tail and saves her from her death. And then, and, and you know, <laughs> and then a facehugger tries to jump at her, but then Andy saves her from the facehugger. Now the alien, the xenomorph, is still holding her, and it comes really close to her and is like inspecting her. And here we have another scene referencing Alien 3, where the xenomorph comes really close to Ripley, opens its one mouth, then the other mouth comes out, oh, the other, the second mouth opens up, but it doesn't kill her. It doesn't kill Ripley because it smells that Ripley's carrying the queen inside of her. A similar scene happens now in the shaft where this a xenomorph grabs our main female character, who, by the way, has not been infected with a face hugger yet, as far as we know. And maybe they're trying to tell us that she was infected. Why did the alien not kill her? And why did it not attack her with its mouth either? It just kind of like sniffed or looked at her. And then Andy manages to get rid of uh, the um, xenomorph alien that was, again, way too slow in reacting, way too slow in attacking uh, the, the main female character. We've seen the xenomorphs in alien Romulus perforate with their dagger several characters. So it's not like they just stopped doing it in this movie. No, they're still doing it. They're still using the dagger tails for that purpose, but they just did not do it with her. Why? We do not know. Again, I feel like they wanted a special way to save her. Like, she falls in the shaft and the alien saves her. Plot twist. I think they wanted to insert this moment as a oh, wow, we've never seen this happen in an alien movie before. But again, it wasn't really earned. It's not justified. We don't know why the alien reacted that way. And then Andy kills that alien, right? That particular alien. And then says, leave her alone, you bitch. Okay. And this is, of course, the reference to Aliens, Alien 2, where Ripley battles. There's a face-off between the two queens, one queen being Sigourney Weaver and the other queen being the alien queen. And she's like saying, like, you know, leave her alone. To She's referencing Newt here and she's telling the queen, leave her alone, you bitch. And Andy in this case says it, but he kind of makes a little joke about it saying, like, leave her alone, you bitch. Like as a question. Of course, it was meant as a slight comedic relief, Easter egg moment. Yes, a ton of people in the IMAX cinema laughed. They felt like they are a part of this. They are in on the joke. People fell for the trap, I feel. You know what I mean? It's like a very cringe moment. Cute if you're a huge fan and you love to hear it repeated in the movie over and over again. For me, it was like, oh, no, they did not go there, did they? Yes, they did. Mm, and, the, mm, <laughs> you know, I, I just, for me, it was very cringe. But anyway, so final verdict. I've been blabbering on for 54 minutes. I hope you're still with me after all this time, and I hope you're enjoying all the visuals that I have here for you. Love the posters, love the artwork, love the trailers, love the xenomorph design and the facehugger design. I even got a popcorn bucket. Uh, unfortunately, the popcorn bucket, and you're, you've probably seen it already uh, in this video as I'm talking, the popcorn, unfortunately, the only popcorn bucket available in the um, Chinese theater was the metal 
popcorn bucket with the embossed alien kind of just partially dripping over it. And the interior of the popcorn bucket is acid green. They also had these cups with the fake kind of double double wall cups with the liquid acid green inside. Anyway, I got those. Cute. I would have wished to have gotten the Cinemark <laughs> Xenomorph head popcorn bucket, but unfortunately the scalpers got a hold of all of those. They all sold out in most Cinemarks even before the first movie aired, which is really, really sad to hear. All you scalpers out there, not cool, not cool, not cool, you guys. So I would have liked to have seen more Xenomorph action, None, none of the weird mutations and cloning and genetic testing. Just a good old, you know, 80s vibes or late 70s vibes. Kind of body horror alien movie. They should have simplified it. The advertisements are wonderful. The design is great. You know, a lot of the sets are beautiful to see. But the plot, they, they should have tightened it quite a bit in certain spots. The movie could have been, could have benefited a lot from being shorter. Uh, it could have benefited a lot from being simpler and more to the point, you know, and not trying to reference every other single movie, alien movie that was made and kind of, kind of shoving a little bit of everything in it. Uh, that did not work for me. Clean it up a bit. Tighten it up, shorten it up, less aliens, but give those fewer aliens more screen time and show us more their behavioral patterns. Give us more the psychology of the aliens as well. This is something that we have not seen really in an alien movie ever. You know, they're, they're just kind of these brain dead beasts like zombies that are just have one aim. But I'm like, come on, give us something more in that direction would have been very, very beneficial. And the movie was less scary than I expected it to be. Uh, from the trailers, I thought it was going to be terrifying. It was not, actually, not at all. All the most terrifying scenes are in the trailer, in my humble opinion. Would I like to see a part two of this? Directed by somebody else, yes. Nothing against Fede Alvarez. Love him to bits. But... It gave me a little bit too much Disney vibes, um, Star Wars-ish. Uh, yeah, let's let's veer away from that and kind of be more visceral. I'm expecting more visceral because the main characters, all of the characters really, very young. I did not understand a word the one of the British actors was saying that that particular dialect or slang or pronunciation he was talking it was really hard for me to understand especially in IMAX cinema where everything was echoing so strongly so you could kind of you would hear things double at a certain point uh, and the characters not very memorable except for Andy 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 is the only really really memorable character I have his face clearly imprinted in my mind the other characters um, and the Asian lady but she benefited from being shaved. I think that's that's what makes her also very memorable. The other characters, I would not recognize them on the street, those actors, if I met them on the street. They just not they, they didn't give me leading character vibes. Although the casting was cute. It was fine. They had nice chemistry between each other, between themselves, but they didn't pop for me. I mean, the main female character is no Sigourney Weaver. Okay, she cute. She young. You know, she's a good actress, but... Okay, you know, she could also fit inside, a, I don't know, a, a sitcom or, or something, you know, reality TV show. She She's cute, but she doesn't give me, she looks like a version of Jennifer Lawrence, maybe. But anyway, I digress. So the movie, all in all, I would not see it again. You know, it was nice to see a new alien movie coming out in summer, very special vibes, but nothing I would want to see again. Like of all the alien movies, it's Alien from 1979 and Aliens that I very gladly revisit 
And every time I do revisit the first two aliens, I am terrified, scared in the best of ways, like no other movie ever managed to scare me. Everything else? Meh, Wicca. Let me know your thoughts down below. Thumb up this video if you've enjoyed it. Subscribe. And until next time, never forget to never give up on H.R. Giger alien love.